There we go. All right. Well, why don't we why don't we begin? Thank you, everyone. Welcome to our, our first first meeting of the year, Historic Resources Committee. Um, I am chair of the committee. I'm Jack Glassman. Uh, our committee, it's uh, I may well be the oldest of the BSA committees, over a century old. So it's a it's an honor to uh, carry the torch <laughs> and uh, to continue to sort of sharing within the profession uh, our uh, our sort of focus on historic resources of buildings, sites, and landscapes, and uh, with uh, as our professionals, and then uh, all our friends and guests, and anyone interested in in uh, historic resources. As, as it's been called for, for a long time, the committee. Um, by day, I work for the National Park Service. Um, I'm a historical architect. I work for a sort of a support center. It's actually based in Lowell. But we support uh, what's called uh, Department of the Interior Region 1, which stretches from Maine to Virginia, uh, although it does not include the, all the national capital sites which have been on the news <laughs> lately. And um, I, uh, well, I just I saw, thought I'd share, uh, just saw in the Globe this piece about the, what happened at the Capitol. Uh, it's entitled, A Desecration of History. It's, uh, it's certainly apropos um, where artifacts were defaced and others paraded as props during the riot at the Capitol. Um, Obviously, within our kind of cohort of uh, you know in preservation, we uh, we we know with interest and dismay, of course, all the the damage to the to the sculpture and the artwork and the and the, the building materials, you know, the kind of materials conservation issues with the doors and frames and windows and the art. Um, but uh, this is obviously much more than that. This attack on really the, the symbol of our democracy, and so. Uh, the sort of attack on our democracy, desecration of history is a, I, I hate to treat it just sort of like a sound bite among our current events, but I, I thought we need to just note this uh, sad uh, event, uh, but also to hope that uh, things will start to get better. Um, on that note, I just wanna sort of for this, the part of the meeting where we're discussing current events and all, uh, I don't wanna just be the talking head. so or face. So uh, please, if anyone, you know, does have um, any thoughts to share, current kind of events that are sort of of note related to preservation, historic structures in terms of buildings or sites or objects or, or planning, uh, urban design that's sort of related to history, historical context, uh, please do, uh, you know, pipe in. So, um, All right. Uh, yeah, I mean the article talks about in detail about what happened, but we all we all know that's gone on. Um, I wanted to just note uh, in memory uh, that uh, uh, Donald L. Stahl uh, passed away. Uh, he was uh, Donald Stahl, FAIA. He was a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. Um, uh, of a talented architect, an inspirational founder of two successful architecture firms. Um, the, um, there were a couple of articles on the Globe. One of them uh, uh, noted, uh, was entitled Architect Design Boston Landmarks. He founded two firms run by black architects when that was rare. Uh, and um, I, again, I guess the terminology again, Norm, I, I often bristle when I see uh, the word landmark used in news releases or whatever, because those of us in the field know that there's this process, a public process, and uh, uh, that's uh, evaluation and assessment of determinations of eligibility, and uh, and then designation as a local landmark or a national landmark. But um, in this case, uh, it definitely seems seems appropriate. Uh, uh, I never met Mr. Stoll, but just knowing all the the transformational kind of uh, the work that he's done in Boston with the, uh, the Ruggles station with that vaulted uh, 
one of the things they were proud of, according to the article, the uh, nine, I think nine Orange Line stations and the, the Southwest Corridor Park. Um, so uh, there was a legacy of buildings, but also of people in that uh, just founding these firms and then encouraging and very diverse uh, women uh, and, and young black architects uh, and many of went on to, you know, spun out to form their own firms. Um, so yeah, the articles really go on talking all about uh, the projects they master planned, uh, presidential design award um, for the Southwest Corridor project. So, um, uh, and then, you know, uh, bringing in uh, David Lee uh, as a, a young man and, Mr. Stow, you know, he mentioned how he couldn't believe there was some, someone else, uh, another black architect, and um, when there were just a handful around the country, and then founding these firms and Stellan Lee, uh, a prodigious uh, amount of uh, great public work, Boston Police Headquarters. Uh, is there anyone, does anyone know, have anything to share, or did they know, worked with Stellan Lee or Mr. Mr. Stell, please? Uh, don't hesitate to speak up. No, okay. Um, I had uh, I had uh, when I was at the at the BRA a long long time ago. I uh, worked with uh, Tom Maestros, uh, who's in recent years worked with Stalin Lee, and I had invited him to. I thought. And I invited him to say a few words, but maybe if he joins in later, then, uh, then we'll give that opportunity. So items of note. Um, just saw a little piece of uh, the paper that they, I'm just trying to start with some good news first. The uh, a culinary award was given to the Union Oyster House. It was named a landmark restaurant. <laughs> there we go again with that. But anyway, hey, it's all, you know, good press, especially for a, a local business and also which opened in 1826. So ostensibly the city's oldest restaurant. Uh, and it was named America's best landmark restaurant by the World Culinary Awards, beating out other popular uh, nominees uh, in New York and San Francisco and New Orleans, uh, Arnold's in New Orleans. Um, speaking of food, uh, did people see that story about uh, ancient Pompeii? There was a, a, a dig uh, yield, um, what the, the Globe called another insight into daily life. It was leftovers were unearthed from an ancient snack bar. And um, they, were, uh, they actually found uh, at least this kind of L-shaped counter with these, impression, with these uh, depressions and they had bowls and there'd be uh, Containers would, would be put in there and they actually found food residue of stew and uh, fish and this and that. Uh, and um, it was called a uh, thermopolium, a snack bar, uh, serving street food, popular back in, back in the old, back in the day. So um, what's also extraordinary though, and I don't know if people saw it, but uh, and you can't see very well here. If I can, let's hear about the decorations on the on the walls, the murals, and on the counter, illustrating presumably the food, the uh, rooster, and uh, uh, um, hanging uh, ducks or whatever that they that they serve. So extraordinary, uh, extraordinary decoration, high quality. Um, speaking of decoration, another good news, sort of good news story was about the Gardner Museum. Uh, it was on the Sunday paper a couple on the December 27th. Excuse me, no rest for the gardener. Closed for now, the museum continues work on conservation, security, horticulture, uh, and more. So, um, and we're familiar with the, the gardener and their, their, the garden, they're famous, you know, they have events. And so the story begins with how uh, uh, earlier in, the, in December, the horticulturists, horticulturalists had been putting together the final touches on the, their holiday garden. 
in the city's most anticipated floral displays and 400, more than 400 flowering plants and ferns and shrubs and all that. But then, then things shut down, officials shut things down more for museums. So they had had a rush and ended up donating, uh, donating the uh, plants to artists and community centers. And so they did make some, something good of that. But meanwhile, they're also continuing so the one advantage, I guess, of being closed is uh, they could proceed more quickly rather than starting and stopping for visitors on uh, work that needs to be done um, with some renovations. So that's the good news part of it. They, um, the tougher news, of course, is the revenue stream and how they're, uh, they've been willing to, they've been able to keep staff on uh, but uh, they don't know how much longer that could go. So you now this was on the 27th, so it's a couple of weeks ago. But um, anyway, so I'm trying to persevere um, and uh, keep things <clears throat> making progress during the, during the pandemic and the closures. Uh, moving across the world, you guys still with me? Uh, in India, there was a, uh, a new, kind of rapidly changing news, sort of, sort of from uh, from bad to uh, to looking better, which uh, relates to Louis Kahn's in Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad, India. It was said to be demolished. The college had had not provided a great deal of uh, justification for proposing to demolish 18 dormitory buildings that are really at the crux of this complex, which is uh, by one of, really one of uh, the world's greatest late uh, you know, architects, Louis Kahn. Uh, this is a key work of, of modern architecture. Um, and so justifiably there was, uh, when that, that news was announced, that uh, the 18 dormitories, which are integral to this whole layout of this design. Um, and you know, we could do whole lectures about Louis Kahn and not by me, but by, um, by uh, the experts. But um, suffice it to say that um, uh, before his tragic death, and I think it was 1970, um, yeah, I think so. And this project wasn't completed until after he died, by the way. The, um, for someone that didn't, that in terms of quantity, number of buildings, uh, he, uh, he and his firm produced a relatively small number, but, <clears throat> but the, of those small numbers, how many of them are considered the, among the greatest works of our sort of <clears throat> heritage, of a heritage architecture. For this, uh, it was described on uh, one uh, by uh, this article by William Curtis as a diagonal flotilla of the 18 dormitories. Uh, and he was, John was uh, inspired by several prototypes in the history of architecture from monasteries to forts and cloisters to brick, the brick cylinders of a 14th century cathedral in France to the outdoor rooms of the 15th century palaces in India. So, uh, uh, Great for, for, for architects, uh, it's, uh, it's really one of those kind of wonder, great wonders and great to look at it, just to look at them as sculptures and, uh, and, as, and as architecture. And then they also had kind of integral natural ventilation too, which seemed to be one of the reasons given for, uh, for the demolition uh, was to, uh, because some students, they wanted air conditioning, they wanted uh, ensuite bathrooms and that kind of thing. But, uh, the good news is uh, that after this worldwide outcry, um, the school has withdrawn the plans to demolish them. Um, I don't know if they were planning to not demolish any of them or, or they're trying to still want to change a few out. But um, anyway, uh, it does show that, uh, that uh, you can uh, make a difference, I guess, activism. The, um, speaking of which, Closer to home, uh, Brookline, the uh, home of uh, one of our greatest, really, giants of American architecture, Henry Hobson Richardson, who <clears throat> designed Trinity Church, um, has that sort of a, starting out a career and then uh, uh, leading to hundreds of uh, 
the, well, railroad stations and, uh, and really in, in kind of redefining a style that came to be known as Richardsonian Romanesque um, with imitators all over, all across North America uh, and all different building types. Anyway, his house was in Brookline, is in Brookline uh, and there was the studio. The studio was a, a, a rambling addition that <clears throat> was subsequently demolished. And um, next door was a house that was lived in by John Charles Olmsted, who was one of the Olmsted brothers of the famous so-called father of American landscape architecture, Frederick Law Olmsted. Uh, and then a third property is also adjacent, which is a mid-century modern a deck, a deck house that uh, had some interior walls stripped, but otherwise in, intact and good condition. All those three were, um, that had a previous pre preservation restriction attached to the, uh, the uh, Richardson, uh, I think it was just to the Richardson house. But anyway, three adjacent properties were bought by a developer of luxury houses and filed for a demolition permit uh, with the Brookline Preservation Commission. So about a week ago, they had the hearing, week, week and a half ago, <clears throat> and they did um, vote to that uh, these were significant properties that were to be studied uh, and discussed. And so they have a reprieve uh, in Brookline, that's 180 days, which is longer than the Boston um, version, but at least it's a, another a chance for other parties or interested parties maybe, uh, partners to come in and uh, hopefully save this building with this incredible associations. Uh, of, and this is where all of these, for Richardson House, were all just about all of the commissions, the great commissions um, emerged really. So, uh, so we'll see what happens on uh, on that one. Hey, Tom Maestros, I see you're you're here. Welcome. You're muted, but uh... it has been a challenge. Uh, it didn't uh, they didn't like my name, so I had to re-register as an alias. Um, apologies there. Well, I think you have a great name. Thank you. I've liked it. That reminds me of when, uh, when we were at the Redevelopment Authority together and, uh, and there was Jim Kostaris and Tom Maestros and uh, you know, Roger Erickson, the landscape architect, would see you coming and say, here come the Greeks, yeah. the Greeks. Yes, so, yes, yes. Anyway, uh, I wasn't sure if you wanted to share any reminiscences about Donald Saul or I didn't want to put you on the spot, but. Um, uh I was thinking about this and how to how to respond to that. Um, uh, just a couple of notes. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, having association with Don on, on three different venues or occasions. The first was when I actually started working at the BR, BRA as a, a, a design review architect. Um, and I had the pleasure of, because I was working in many Roxbury projects, um, I had the pleasure of reviewing a couple of projects that uh, uh, Don had, meeting and, and reviewing some of the projects that Don was the uh, architect on. Um, we have a Midwestern uh, association. We both come from Ohio. Um, so maybe shared some common bond there, but uh, I was just always impressed by just how, it, um, it, it, one of the things that I always remember about the BRA and doing design review was, when I talked to architects, I said, tell me what it is you're trying to achieve. Because if you don't tell me what you're trying to achieve, then I'm going to try and interpret it and, you know, and, and insert what I think it should be. And Don was always one of those who had such a strong personality and that it was never an issue. He would always tell me exactly what it was he was trying to achieve. Um, the, the next association that I had with him then was when I was the director of the Civic Design Commission and Don was one of the members. And again, his uh, insightfulness, um, uh, uh, his ability to never be arbitrary or capricious, capricious in his comments uh, were just really something to behold. And then the final association was when I went and actually after the BRA and working in some other venues. I did some consulting with his firm, mostly working with David, but also doing uh, architecture. And it was then I really got to know Don and the, the depth to which he uh, enjoyed design, 
the way he felt design and architecture was important in the uh, uh, in the in the uh, um, development of cities and the development of an influencing of people on the way they interfaced with the world. It, uh, it was the first time that I had an, anyone refer to the gestalt of architecture. I mean, he just, he was just really a, a, a master. And, and the biggest thing that I always remembered is even from the first day that I met him is he was colorblind. I mean, he, he did have his very strong beliefs and desires to progress and help uh, minorities as they entered and tried to develop in the, fir in the field. But anyone who had a, a, a somewhat genuine notion about themselves or a true belief in architecture and humanity were, were immediately um, um, taken in by Don and supported and, uh, and uh, uh, just, it was just, it was just really great in that regard. Uh, so I, I had the real pleasure and benefit of knowing Don for now almost 30, over 30 years. And uh, I have to say that he was uh, really, uh, in my early days, very much a mentor and then uh, 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 an associate and, uh, and someone who really wanted to advance the profession and make things better, not only in, in architecture, but for people in general. So I uh, uh, hope that was of some benefit and, and uh, uh, did him well. Um, and uh, we certainly will miss him. Thank you. Thanks. That's that's great. Okay. Definitely. Um, all right. And just a couple more items of uh, of note that I I had. Let's see. From uh, we got the get the get the globe delivered. So I'm always finding things in the globe. But so if it seems slanted, then the, then it's uh, mea culpa. Um, the uh, did see that uh, a sort of. Sadly, the the uh, Via Victoria Center for the Arts, the building, the church that had been built in 1897 or eight was uh, as a Lutheran church was uh, was demolished. Um, it um, I guess they they uh, it wasn't part of, part of the plan, but it was just it turned out to be uh, turned out to be too expensive. And after engineering analyses and uh, uh, and then weighing all the all the things that had to be completely rebuilt. So uh, that was just recently, I think, when they finally uh, had to uh, had to take it down. But um, the um, renovation project for the uh, the arts uh, the organization, um, which I won't try to pronounce, but uh, they um, was supposed to cost only eleven million dollars. But then with all the repairs, it, it would have been twenty four million. So. Um, you hate to see that sort of fabric here in the south end. Uh, it was uh, 85 West Newton Street. The fabric lost, but um, um, hopefully there'll be um, some good news in terms of a uh, replacement um, to fill in that block. Anyway, um, the other other transitions, I guess, is that finally the the uh, in the title of the Globe story, deemed tone deaf, the statue of Lincoln uh, and the ex, ex slave, the ex uh, uh, slave was removed, uh, comes amid the US reckoning on race, of course. So um, this was after uh, some time ago when the Boston Art Commission uh, did vote unanimously to. Uh, Remove the so-called emancipation group uh, sculpture. So hasn't been decided, I guess, where where it will be relocated. But uh, I think the plan is uh, for it to go somewhere where where the story and the larger context, which is important, uh, can be uh, can be interpreted. So again, if any uh, if anyone has any any thoughts to share, then uh, feel free to speak up. Um, then uh, something completely different, but uh, another, uh, maybe actually a less controversial, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, here's Philip Johnson's, uh, the house that uh, Philip Johnson uh, had uh, designed and had built as part of his uh, graduation project from Harvard's Graduate School of Design in 1942. Um, 
the title of the article, Philip Johnson, an ugly history that must be named. Um, the house uh, has officially been renamed, uh, its address, which happens to be its address, 9 Ash Street, and no longer known to be known as the Philip Johnson thesis house. So this was one of those uh, um, badly kept, I guess, or just sort of ignored, um, it is a, a thoughtful and well-reasoned uh, essay by Murray White in the Globe. I do recommend it, and you can see in the cited in the bibliography, my little bibliography on the meeting agenda. But uh, because of Johnson's uh, embracing uh, Nazism and um, white supremacy, uh, you know, he's he's had contributed you know, important buildings to the to the. Uh, modern architecture genre, I guess, but as far as uh, some of the naming that, uh, uh, that's the, the work of uh, how, to, how to balance those things. But he, he, he embraced, uh, he saw Hitler speak, he embraced Nazism, he was uh, anti-Semitic uh, and so on and so forth. But it's, uh, it's just a, a, a news story about the renaming, but with a lot of interesting background that I recommend. This was in the Globe, uh, uh, the middle of the month, December, December 13th. So um, it's not on the agenda, but just a couple of other, other items of note. The, uh, uh, in New York, the, uh, the transformation is a new train hall that's part of uh, expanding Penn Station. Um, nation's busiest rail terminal. So uh, uh, that's uh, been another kind of an evolution from uh, starting with, uh, I guess, the 1963-64, the raising of the above ground portion of the historic Penn Station, uh, which then made room to create Madison Square Garden and uh, all the, the, the uh, controversy over that and actually that contributing in some ways to a landmark uh, historic preservation case in the Supreme Court dealing with Grand Central Station uh, and, the, and the, the New York Landmarks Preservation, the land, their Landmarks Commission, their, their, their powers in general. So a big question, but all sort of related to that. And then I saw in tonight's paper, so sort of final item uh, was uh, about the, um, that planners are poised to sign off on the Edison site redevelopment in South Boston, the shuttered Boston Edison plant on Elf Street. Um, it says powering up a new vision for the old plant. Uh, it's been, been, developers have been working on that for like five, four or five years since they acquired the property and they're set to, it's set to be a vote, I guess this evening at the BPDA about that project. A lot of uh, negotiating back and forth because it's uh, next to the Conley Industrial Terminal and it was going to be a ton of housing and, uh, and there were concerns about the housing versus industry with the haul roads and so on. So stay tuned on that one. And as we turn our attention to a South End institution, the League of Women for Community Service, uh, I wanted to just share a uh, yeah. My, my sort of little backstory on that, which was that when I, I worked for the for the, the BRA, I joined in, in 85 and, uh, and left in 92. At some point when I was there on staff at the BRA, and then in 1990, I had a little stint while I was at the BRA as, as kind of the acting staff architect for the city, the environment department. But at some time, maybe before that, a small delegation of us, we were sort of, a, invited or you know, someone to, to head over to um, Mass Ave to see this the League of Women for Community Service, their headquarters, their mansion. Uh, I don't remember what was our assignment or our charge. I was you know, one of the, the staff members that went, but what I remembered, and it's now 30, over 30 years ago, was that I was just, I was charmed. I was just enchanted. <laughs> By visiting by the house, the beauty of it, and by by the, the the ladies who were just so welcoming and proud of the of their the institution, and um, I don't remember what all sort of came of that, but I uh, but that always stuck with me visiting, and so it was uh, you know a few a few months ago I guess 
couple months ago and I was just Googling. I was thinking, whatever happened to, to the organization? And I, and I was uh, sort of, my heart sank a little and I saw some references looking online or these business things that said they've, they've not checked in on the, you know, uh, no one's heard from them. I saw that 2016 South End the newsletter and I thought, well, have, have they made it? Because the other thing I remembered from my visit was that uh, the women were sort of lamenting how it was cha the challenge of, of engaging younger women at the time, getting them to join the organization. So this is in the late, late 80s. And so uh, that was the other thing I wondered about. Did they, were they able to, to, uh, to continue? So then uh, the, the searching ultimately led me, ultimately led me to Gina, uh, and then to come to find out that Spencer Sullivan, but that in fact, uh, they've got a designation as a historic site. Uh, they won a preservation projects a, a, a grant to do some, some work and that they are alive and well. And so, uh, so exciting that, that there's uh, work being done. So uh, that's, that's longer than I intended it to be, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm just so pleased uh, that, uh, that you're, you're still going and that you'll be sharing your story with us. So we have the executive director, Gina Gomes Cruz, who uh, earned an art degree, a degree in art with a concentration in architecture from Northeastern. Uh, she worked for a number of architectural firms focusing on higher ed projects and she has a specialization in OPM, Owner's Project Management. Uh, she was, uh, these were sort of my words, interpreting, but persuaded by the, by the then uh, the, uh, the league president to join and become the organization's executive director. And she really hit the ground running from what I gather and has uh, <coughs> secured a number of grants for repair and rehab of the building already and continues to, continues with fundraising. Uh, Jackie Arrington has been uh, a longtime member, dare, dare I say, she wrote since 1978 and indeed was a, a past president of the, of the league. She's a semi-retired pediatric nurse practitioner, worked uh, in a number of public and private schools as a nurse and also as a, the director, director of health services. She continues, uh, she's been a Roxbury resident for over 40 years and uh, really continues, has a natural affinity for needs of uh, children, uh, that wellness and uh, the children who attend schools. Uh, and she will continue that in her formal, after her formal retirement. Curtis Maxwell Perrin is a project manager. He, uh, among other things, he, he maintains a career focus on preservation advocacy, design and historical research. He's an adjunct professor at Wentworth School of Architecture, and uh, he's, uh, he's employed as the project manager uh, for Spencer Sullivan and Vote, which is in Boston, right here in my neighborhood here in Charlestown now. Uh, and he's worked on a number of feasibility studies, including this one for the restoration of 558 Mass Ave, uh, and uh, worked on some other projects, uh, landmark designation for Roxbury's African Orthodox Church. Uh, he was trained in uh, offices in uh, Paris, uh, Cesar Pelli's office in New Haven, Alcus Manfredi in Boston, uh, and he has degrees at Bowdoin, uh, Harvard University BSD Graduate School of Design, and a doctorate from, he's a PhD from Yale University. And, uh, and I understand we also have Adrian uh, Benton, uh, another longtime member who is uh, representing the league as well. Uh, Gina, did I, did I miss anything or if not? Uh, no, I, and thank you for the well, introduction, Zach. Um, but Adrian is here with us, as I mentioned, and we didn't get to give her information. So Adrian, if you wanted to just say a little bit about yourself, and you've been a longtime member too. If you wanna just let us know how long you've been a member. Oh, you're on mute, Adrian. Doing my special Zoom duty by being on mute. Mm -hmm. um, I actually moved to the Boston area in 1992 and uh, became aware of the league, uh, primarily 558, because I was initially interested in the building, uh, probably 
I would have to say close to the 2000s. And uh, then I was able to find, you know, find the organization basically. So I've been with the league probably the last 10 to 12 years, maybe Jackie, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> it, I think so, Adrian, yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't have gray hair then. I had, you know, more black hair then. So, so it's yeah. been, uh, so it's been a while. But, um, but I'm a business person here. I used to be a former hospital administrator. Uh, I have a business called Onyx Spectrum Technology. And uh, we do work primarily for the federal government in the air, areas of electro opticals, optical repair and um, electronics repair, mainly for legacy equipment. So we, we're the ones that keep the old stuff running basically. But, um, but the first time I saw 558, I just fell in love with the building. So I fell in love with the building before I fell in love with the organization. And I got to know the league members and became a member of the league. And um, we're finally getting, getting some momentum again with, uh, with having Gina come on as um, executive director uh, and also working with um, the architecture firm. We've been able to really, really get some momentum in terms of getting some additional funds um, into the building. Uh, I do have to say we have a wonderful board of directors. Uh, I'm a part of the board of directors and um, the board has made, you know, substantial <coughs> contributions to, you know, to um, the restoration of the building. But of course we need other people's money. And I'm hoping that uh, when you see the presentation here today, that you will be encouraged to help steer us to other people's money to keep this gem um, um, thriving. Um, even given the disrepair, though, you'll see from the presentation that um, that the building is remarkably still uh, very much intact and 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 just a beautiful, beautiful structure. It's one of the um, uh, most intact buildings, I think, in the in the South End in terms of the original architecture. So so basically, things look the same in the building for the most part uh, as they did when it was built uh, pr pr prior to the Civil War. So I'll turn it back over to you guys. Thanks, Adrian. All right. Well, why don't I, I will bring up the PowerPoint, uh, which Gene is kind enough to send to me. And while I'm doing that, just a reminder that in the chat box, for those who are interested in the, getting the AIA CE credit, then there is a, a link to the uh, a very brief form. So, share screen. Let's go to this one here. Actually. All right, so my screen says I'm sharing. Are you all seeing the uh, cover? Yeah. Yes. All right, so I, I guess I'll, I'll take uh, uh, take your lead for uh, for the presentation. I know if uh, okay. these were, we're going to Curtis. Yeah. Yeah, and we all, each of us, you know, when we're ready to move on, we'll just let you know. But we're going to just start off with Curtis talking about the architecture and the interior, since Curtis was really the person behind this very robust feasibility study that uh, we now have, which is amazing. So I'm going to let him talk about that, and we'll chime in a little too. And then I'm going to have um, Jackie speak about the history. And um, I'm going to wrap up with what we're, we're um, doing now, um, but all four of us will be uh, commenting as we go along. So, um, Curtis, I'll let you start. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you. I think that it's important that we put whatever I say in brackets, because really this is the league's thing. And I'm so privileged and honored to have been able to be part of what we're doing here because um, we were working with a grant from MHC to do a conditions assessment at the building as well as a feasibility study to figure out what could be done. And we entered into this work just as the most dark days of the pandemic descended onto us and it was very disorienting. Um, suddenly we were isolated and stuck at home and things continued to get worse. So through a period where life seemed to become difficult, uh, I was tasked with 
delving into the research on this building and the organization that it houses. And it's been such a privilege to have had that task, even though it was complicated by not having access to resources like libraries, because as the world spun out of control to delve into the history and see what has been going on here in a quiet way since 1920, when the League purchased the building, um, has been an ongoing encouragement to me and fostered um, my ability to simply be involved in whatever small way with the forces that are going on at large in the world, because the League has been fighting since the beginning of their founding for uh, the cause of equal rights for women, as well as um, equity for Black people. And that's just been very inspiring to be part of. So I want to just thank them again for our ability to be able to do this. The League, incidentally, was founded um, in 1918, just as World War I was coming to an end under the name, the Soldiers Comfort Unit. And you guys, you really have been a comfort to me in that sense. So <laughs> you still bear out the mission of those days. And I don't wanna to take too much from you, Jackie. So um, tell me if I'm poaching on your territory, but- Curtis, you're doing fine. I, I love it, okay. <laughs> in 1918 and 1919, as the war was coming to an end, the soldiers were, um, brought back to the United States and put into internment camps before they were discharged. And at the very same time, the pandemic of 1918 hit. And so these internment camps were the place where that disease had its initial outbreak and they became places where you simply couldn't leave. And the men were locked up there. Um, and in particular, black men who had at that time been brought to Europe to fight for the United States um, and treated as people who were expected to carry all of the burdens of that public service, upon returning thought that maybe this would be the point at which they were included as equal citizens, but found instead that in the camps they were subject to more racism and more difficult treatment than they had been in the past. And this group of women formed the Soldiers Comfort Unit. And if you think about what they say they did, which was to bring pies and sweaters and things like that out to the camps, it sounds very genteel. But in fact, this was an effort to bring aid to a disorienting pandemic situation very much like what we face right now. And it must have taken an incredible amount of courage to walk into a camp where there's a pathogen and um, to bring aid and comfort was really an extraordinary gesture. Um, at the same time, the League was also beginning to become involved in the anti-lynching movement. And the founding members of the League were all of them very accomplished women who had careers, which was not the norm at the time, uh, whether for white or black women. Um, they had careers in education and nursing and other professional areas and had contacts with a lot of um, people who were able to help them in publishing endeavors and outreach work that led to involvements even at the national level in the anti-lynching cause. So I, I think it's important to start with the League because they're still here. Um, they've been here since 1920 and I hope they'll be here for a long time to come. And what we've been doing is looking at the building and um, putting together this report with an eye toward it becoming the basis for the application uh, to receive grant money to help with the restoration challenges here because there um, are significant challenges. When this building was constructed in 1858, it was considered to be Boston's most extravagant house. And it really does 
live out some of um, that even today. And maybe we should advance a few slides, but even in this one, you can see the incredible level of ornate Victorian detail that is throughout this structure. It's a row house on Chester Square. It was built when this was a mud flat and people were speculatively buying up the lots. We're talking about prior to the Back Bay. So these were prestige addresses. And the man who built the house was named William Carnes. He was a dealer in mahogany. He imported mahogany wood and um, sold that and also uh, ran various ventures over the years that were involved in the production of furniture and furniture veneers. When he built this house, as well as a twin house next door, um, he decided to use this as the occasion to show off everything that he could do. So throughout the house, there are rare tropical woods. Um, there's mahogany as well as several other species that are um, arrayed by floor to give kind of thematic arrangements to the building um, and just incredible levels of carving and uh, also brought in all of these elements like the chandelier that you're seeing here, um, the mirrors, which at the time cost the equivalent of $100,000 in today's money. So these were really significant investments in aggrandizing himself. Um, but as with so many such stories, Carnes um, ended up bankrupt and the house was put up for auction. Um, maybe we can advance to the slide that has that auction notice. One more, I think. One more, there we go. So this, we can go back one. This auction notice appeared in the paper in 1868. Carnes debts caught up with him and he was forced to sell the house for himself, he ended up living in a shack on a cottage on Squam Lake for the remaining 30 years of his life. Mm -hmm. He seemed to have been displeased with this. There are pictures of him in a top hat cleaning fish. Um, he was apparently an eccentric person. We don't have a lot of data on him, but um, he definitely was somebody who was not afraid to break with normal patterns. He built this house which stood out he also is um, credited with having run an underground railroad station from the building. So in addition to the League's presence here, there was this prior chapter of involvement with history of Black people in this country, fortunately in a positive light, that the League inherited upon um, purchasing this structure. But the auction notice in the paper is extraordinary because it's clearly written by Carnes himself and reads like a specifications manual for the house and its construction, even down to specifying the name of the hinge company that produced some really exquisite sterling plated hinges for the doors that have a very intricate mechanism that conceals the points of attachment. So um, Carnes was really proud of what he had done and um, clearly he wanted to show that off, but he doesn't seem to have had misgivings about leaving it behind. It was not the first time that he went bankrupt. He lost a prior house in Roxbury, apparently in a similar snafu. So um, he rolled with the punches. Uh, what he left us is this extraordinary building. And we had a picture in here somewhere with the central stair atrium. Can we find that? That, this is good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's, a, there's a stairway that rises up through the building and it has, if we go back one slide, it has, um, an incredible series of loggias that um, open off of it and is really one of, I think, the most dramatic stairways that I've ever encountered, certainly the most sumptuous in a residence in Boston. 
And we're extremely fortunate that there have been no alterations to this structure and that um, it survives in its configuration as a single family house with this incredible <clears throat> up through all of the levels and a stained glass laylight at the top that illuminates it all the way down. Um, the house next door, which was a twin house down to the every detail, unfortunately, shows what happens when buildings like this are forced to be put onto the market, that in order to convert it into condos or residential spaces, as it is now configured, the house next door had to be eviscerated because this kind of stairway can't pass any sort of modern safety code. Um, so that's one of the challenges in working with the league and this building that to preserve elements like this precludes many uses for the upper floors that might otherwise provide income generating opportunities for the organization. So uh, we've had to be very creative with the approach uh, in terms of funding. But I'm happy to say that um, we have a small commitment from the Henderson Foundation already to rebuild the front steps and a tentative commitment, which looks to be finalized perhaps today with the CPA for a significant amount of money that will begin this project. Um, let's see Ivan Meijer is on. And that's the state, uh, the community, well, state pro programs, Community Preservation Act um, with local funding. Yeah, that's, that's the Community Preservation Act that um, we put in an application for $500,000 and the initial recommendation from the city on, um, was it Tuesday that we had the meeting, Gina, or Monday, was for $400,000. So we're very much hoping that that will be the final designation or, or even more. And if you all want to send your money, I'm sure the league will, will uh, appreciate it. Um, but the, 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 um, the challenges of working with a building like this are just extraordinary because it was built with such a level of detail and used the um, materials that it did <coughs> when they require replacement and many of them are reaching their usable life, in particular, the brownstone on the outside has um, exceeded its ability to do its job. Uh, you're faced with a challenge because these are um, repairs that would task even a well-heeled organization um, significantly to be able to do. And I know that there's work that Harvard has been doing on one of its Richardson buildings that has required brownstone replacement. And even Harvard with its billions and billions of dollars endowment has applied for grant funding to um, supplement their ability to conduct that work. And then you have on our side, an organization, a minority organization, and there are challenges faced by black organizations that result from years and years of inequitable treatment in society, it is almost impossible to think of paying for this. And the League has maintained the building very lovingly over the years, but some of these um, elements are just beyond the ability of any organization to itself be responsible for. So we're very hopeful that um, the public will agree in this regard and um, be able to provide enough money that we can stabilize the building. I think um, otherwise there's the great risk that it would simply have to be sold. And um, I know the league doesn't want that to happen. I don't want that to happen. And uh, yet the challenges to working through the budget constraints are, are very, very big. Um, when we started um, the semester at Wentworth this year, the school asked all the instructors, regardless of department, to have the first day be dedicated to some aspect of minority life in this country. So in the architecture department where I teach, we thought about um, 
how to conduct that. In my own class, I did what is always the best solution and threw it to the students and let them take care of um, this topic because I think it's one that um, has to go beyond simply saying that we've identified some people who are minorities who work in the field and that there should be something um, even beyond that about what is the experience of being from a different race and how that is expressed through architecture. And I think here we have a very interesting um, phenomenon that everyone who enters this building is profoundly changed by the shape of it. And the league themselves, I think, has taken their identity from the form of the space. And this is an expression of um, something about that aspect. I'm not sure that I'm really the person who would be the one to say it, but I do think that we can at least put that there for something to think about, about um, preservation of this as a kind of minority space, even though it was built by somebody else, they've fully taken ownership of it. And um, I think that that's where I'll stop and let, let the league go on with um, their, their comments. Thanks, Curtis. No, that's great. Mm -hmm. You know, Jack, if you could um, move the, the slides forward until we get to the, the slide with Mariah Baldwin, that's yeah. where Jackie will take over. Perfect. Okay. So I'm not sure how much I'll take over, but uh, I'll try and make a valiant effort um, because my old brain had to really work hard to remember back to 78. Um, so um, when I joined the league, there was a um, president, her, her name was Louise Corbin. And um, everybody talked about Mariah Baldwin, Mariah Baldwin. But in fact, uh, although she was one of the founders and the first president of the league, uh, Ms. Baldwin, when she retired um, from her principalship at the um, Agassiz School in Cambridge, moved to the South End. And um, unfortunately, she only lived four years after her retirement and only a year after or so after this organization was started. So she and a, a woman named Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, who was married to the first black um, judge in Massachusetts, um, was a suffragette. She was a leader in um, all causes for, for women. Um, and she too died in, 19, in 18, 1922. So these women did not live long to benefit, to see the benefits um, of their work in starting this organization, but they left it in very capable hands. So I was looking at our um, roster here of former presidents of the organization, and I came across the, the first name that I recognized, a person that was living and I, and I absolutely knew her, was Thelma Miles, who was um, one of the first if not the first black graduates of Boston City Hospital School of Nursing. And um, she, was, she was an able leader. She, she broke no foolishness. Um, she had it all planned and we did what Thelma, I guess people did what Thelma Miles said. I was not a member when she was president. But we go down the list and there are um, far, probably five or six of the women that I, that, I, that I did know worked with um, before they died. Because in 1978, when I joined the league, I had um, a wonderful mentor, Dorothy Clark, who lived in the South End and um, was an activist there. And her husband owned a pharmacy in the South End. And Dorothy was just all over the place. I think they're members of the South End Historical Society who will remember her. Um, fondly and she was just determined that I would understand the mystique of and, uh, 558 and the league as she called it and what it was and what she wanted it to be or what her, what her vision was, how this organization would go forth. We had meetings on Sunday afternoon about two o'clock as many of the members were um, 
at that time pretty elderly. They were coming from church services. And um, as a younger member uh, at that time, I spent many, many hours um, fixing tea and serving cookies to these little ladies and then washing their, their teacups that they insisted upon having, no styrofoam then, and um, just to hold them over until they could get home. So uh, they were a, a funny group, kind of on their way out and they knew it, but determined to stay in control. So um, Gina often asked me, she says, well, what did the league do? Uh, during the 80s and the 90s. And I said, well, it was a difficult time because um, I came to Boston in 1966 from Indiana and um, knew little about cities. You know, like I'm from a small town in, in Northern Indiana and I only knew Chicago to visit. So Boston was my big experience in life, uh, living in a big city. As my mother said, a horrible big city. She, she has never liked it here. But um, we, I said, well, Gina, I think that what, what happened in the, in the 80s, late 70s and early 80s, was that we had a number, we had a small number of Blacks when I moved to Boston living here, uh, professional Blacks, just, just a small number. And I think what happened with um, the black population in this Metro Boston area was that people would come to Boston, look at housing, look at schools, and they moved to the suburbs. So black middle class, upper middle class were, were scattered throughout the suburbs and not in the city, not located in the city of Boston. And so I think Curtis made mention of the fact that we had a very difficult time attracting uh, younger women who might be interested in such an organization. We also had the competition of um, sororities, um, fraternal organizations, um, social clubs that black women aspire to belong to. And they did this, you know, in suburban groups and often there was a Boston chapter, but they were not vitally interested in, in the work that happened at the league. They were more social in nature, although they all have a bent towards um, community service and um, philanthropy. So uh, it was very hard. We also had the advent of, I remember attending the opening of Copley Place, 1983, I believe it opened. And um, but there were very few hotels in Boston until that point. I think the Marriott was built maybe 1984 and the Sheridan had been down in um, Back Bay since 1965. But the opening of the um, Copley Place, the Marriott, opened some opportunities for, um, for groups of individuals and especially blacks to venture outside for um, social events, for fundraisers, for whatever they wanted to do. And as I said, a large group of people were in the suburbs and had access to um, other venues for, for having these social events. So we were facing this not so great population of um, black women that were interested in organizations like the league and we had opportunities and venues were open for people to go other places. And so we continued our work um, in, the, in the small way that we could and um, continued with, with such things. We've never forgotten the uh, Mariah Baldwin presidential scholarship that we give each year to a public school student who, um, has improved grades or you know, has a compelling story about, about grades. And so that continued from um, throughout, that has continued throughout. We are um, women from um, our um, efforts to do housing in Boston. It presented a problem after a while because the system had always been that we had a um, matron quote that lived in the house and um, 
kind of oversaw the the the, um, the women that lived there. But um, and we always talk about we hear talk about Coretta Scott King as being one of the alumni um, from the house, and she and her sister, in fact, lived at 558 when they were students in Boston. I think her sister was a little older than she, and attended Boston University. And Coretta was at the um, New England Conservatory for, for her voice and her music. So our programs though, that um, made an impact, I think the most impact with, um, with the community and the city during the eighties or so, is that I was working in the public schools at that time and came across a young woman who was, um, I don't know where I met Chris Bond, but, um, wonderful young woman with enthusiasm and um, she was interested in doing something about the for adolescents and teenagers with the um, advent of the AIDS epidemic in the city and no health education classes really formally taught in our public school systems uh, not just the city but the suburbs also so with the help of a very dedicated friend, um, she made an appeal and for six years, they were tenants at 558, um, paying a very nominal, nominal fee, maybe a hundred dollars a month to help with electricity or water or whatever. And that, that was th that place with their headquarters. And um, so the kids rehearsed there, but they did theater. And um, a number of the children in that group were Metco students, and they, so they were bused to different suburbs. And they enjoyed a very robust and um, fulfilling mission for a number of years with their theater um, and going out to different um, schools and venues doing theater arts and teaching sexuality education, which many people didn't want to talk about, but certainly um, made a contribution. So we're very proud of that connection we had with a group called We Talk. We're educators, a touch of class is what they call themselves. So um, we were also, um, until Filings went out of business, one of the charities for Filings Basement. So when I joined the league, uh, Mr. Cleveland Pinckney was one of the first names that I learned. And I think he was um, a friend of one of the members, belonged to the same church or something, but what a wonderful, dedicated man he was. Filing's basement had that method of marking down. And so for people that are younger or not familiar with Boston uh, and the old filings and filing's basement, um, they had a system of bringing the clothing from upstairs down to the basement. They dated it. And after 12 days, maybe it was 10% off of the sales price, maybe 14 days later, it was 25%. And after it reached maybe 30 days, it was given to charity. So we were one of the charities. And one of the um, people in that, that area, Lower Roxbury, um, the South End, women that were smart, savvy, um, take care of their homes. They lined up on that third Saturday every month. And the line would extend from our building on at 558, almost down to Washington Street, um, down Mass Avenue, because we were busy um, in that month between sorting. Mr. Pinckney though, without him, we wouldn't be able to do it because filings would call him and at a moment's notice, he'd go pick up this clothing and, bring it down. We spent hours in the evening sorting clothing and um, and then selling it or practically giving it away. We just wanted it gone. Um, and it wasn't so much a money-making profit uh, venture for us as it was a um, look forward to an exciting adventure for um, for neighbors and people in the neighborhood and women that knew about it. And um, I just, I, I really missed when, when it stopped, when it stopped. 
it was hard, hard work, but it was it was wonderful work that we did there. The um, founders of this organization were always trying to to be relevant um, and meet the needs of the community. So um, I thought it was really, um, we didn't do this in the eighties, but I, I, when looking for materials and things to present, I um, talked to a man who used to attend the, what is now the Hurley School, it was the Dwight School um, behind the league on, on West Spring, East Springfield Street. And he says that during the depression, he distinctly remembers he and two brothers coming over. And I don't know why they only gave it to the boys, but they had hot chocolate, hot, hot chocolate every day for the boys. And they came over and had this. But what he said next was most important. He said his parents would not let them miss a day of school. He says, we probably came to school sick because that was our meal for the day and then maybe they had dinner that evening because money was very, very scarce. And so the practicality of the um, group of women there um, was, it, it was outstanding and it was, it was just astounding. And so despite their social status, uh, as many of them were married or as Curtis said, worked in professions, teaching, nursing, um, most many, they possessed a practicality that um, many black women have always had and it has contributed to the upward mobility and self-improvement in the black community. So they clean that house, the members clean that house um, with the help of Mr. Pinckney, he did a lot of the heavy cleaning. Uh, they prepared refresh, refreshments for events that were help, that held there. They washed an iron tablecloth, but it was always impeccable. And that was a reputation that they wanted to maintain. I was on the house committee for many, many years. My husband who was now deceased would say, oh my goodness, because uh, he too was on the house committee and um, spent many, many hours um, buffing that floor with a commercial buffer that he had rented. and. Uh, those were good times though. They were hard working times, but they were good times. So I um, think that the um, Adelaide Cromwell, who is a, uh, who's now deceased, she's a professor emerita at Boston University School of Sociology, um, wrote a book uh, called the, Boston, the Other Boston Brahmins. And she focused on the um, upper class blacks in Boston and had much writing and much to say about the 558 and the league and its activities and what, what she thought they were. And they're just volumes, there's so much to read and there's so much information that it's really hard to condense it and, and, and bring it down. But, um, we were also responsible in the 70s and eight, the 80s, 80s and 90s for um, trying to rent the facility and, and for some income. So people like Adelaide had a, um, she was still intent upon supporting that institution because of where it was and, and who it was. And so she had her 75th birthday there and in order to celebrate it, um, she hated the linoleum that was in the foyer. So had some carpeting taken up from her lovely home in Brookline and installed in the foyer at um, 558. So it's served many, many years. As Adelaide died in 19, 2019, just a few months short of her 100th birthday, but she was she was an outstanding uh, woman with a lot of opinion, a lot of sass, but a lot of commitment to um, supporting um, our institution there at 558. So we had many weddings. I, I oversaw many weddings at 558 and a couple insisted upon using that grand stairway that um, Curtis ha ha has shown you on the slides. Um, we were not 
doing the rentals for a price that we couldn't do it today uh, because we didn't charge the money so much to make money as we just wanted the league to be used for um, for a good purpose. And so the amount of money was nominal and uh, the amount of work was astronomical, but people were so grateful and so happy to have that, that venue at that time. So um, our educational pursuits um, go further than Coretta Scott King living there because um, there are two, I can think of two outstanding persons that I happen to know who lived at 558 because many, many um, socially prominent black families in the 50s wanted their daughters who were attending places like Boston University seems to come up time and time again to have a safe place to live uh, since they were not allowed to live in the dorms. So I think about um, Della Taylor Hardiman, who was an educator, um, an artist, and born in Charleston, West Virginia, I believe, but came here for graduate studies at BU where she met Dorothy Alexander Parks, a former wife of Paul Parks, who was at one point um, on the Boston Redevelopment Authority, who was a um, head of the um, State Department of Education. But um, Dorothy was one of the first black probation officers in the Boston Juvenile Court. And she happened to be from my state of Indiana. So when I met her, she really took very good care of me. She was always willing to give advice. And then Dr. Hardiman um, eventually settled on Martha in Martha's Vineyard and is so esteemed that on the fourth Sunday, fourth Saturday every July, there's a celebration held for Dr. Hardiman on Martha's Vineyard. So there were just a number of um, outstanding, wonderful African-American women who moved through that building um, as students in Boston. So our fundraising activities were small. We, we can't compare them today, but we had an annual event. Uh, we would set up tables. We had a Christmas bazaar, um, well, well attended. Again, there were lines. The vendors would notify their friends um, and their own publicity. And so th this was a $15 a table or something. So certainly we weren't in it for the money. We were just really trying to provide services. I remember meeting a child through a big sister organization. Um, they lived in Roxbury. And when I asked the mom if she wanted to go in town with me one day, I was we were on the orange line. And she said she'd never gone past Dudley Station. And no, she didn't want to go downtown shopping, you know, that everything she needed was at Dudley. So it was a, um, it was a shock to me, but I, I think I, as I came to know Boston better and came to, to understand things um, from a um, socioeconomic standpoint, um, I better understood her, her attitude, but I was always dismayed that they had ne that family had never ventured downtown. So um, not quite that way anymore. I am um, going to stop here. If there's any place that I can add anything later or if people have questions, I will certainly try to answer them. Thank you, Jackie. That was You're welcome. Great. And Jack, if you could just go through the slides, just you just go forward a little. Um, yeah, and that's- Here's Coretta. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go on to the next. And this is history of the league over the years, lots and lots of activities. And by the way, we do have a website that was recently launched. 
It's lwcsboston.org. It was on the front page. And um, we've got a lot of information about the organization there. Um, we're still building it up um, because there's just so, so much to talk about. And to um, it, it's just, it's an amazing history. Um, so um, you should definitely check that out. And Jack, you can go forward again. All right. And I found it, by the way, and I put it in the bibliography, this uh, essay by Craig Goethe, I don't know, that's um, entitled, it's a scholarly footnoted um, a Black Elitism and Cultural Entrepreneurship in 1920s Boston, Massachusetts, uh, the League of Women for Community Service. But really goes uh, kind of a deep dive. Uh, yeah. So that, that is one of at least four major articles that have appeared from scholars writing about the League. And I think. Mm -hmm. They're actually important to think about in connection with the slides that we're looking at here with the representations of the League's undertakings over the years, because we're dealing with a history of groups that in large part were disenfranchised, even though at the same time we're talking about an elite group, <coughs> a Boston Black Brahmin group, as, as um, some have called it. Dr. Cromwell, Adelaide Cromwell. Mm -hmm. At the same time, um, what we're hearing from Jackie and seeing in these uh, examples of the League's work is um, what in the scholarly articles, including Doty's, um, they refer to as cultural capital. The idea that um, through these undertakings, some of them small community activities, others that had to do with bringing the world of the arts, especially black involvement in the arts to a wider notice that the league was investing in black culture and that there were returns that came from that, that um, a kind of prestige attached to participating in those activities returned to the league as an asset. And then by joining the league, other women could receive the benefit of that asset and that this was absolutely catalytic in terms of helping women and black women in particular move forward. Um, one of the things that I think is absolutely amazing about group and this property is that the league members have very carefully in the great New England tradition never thrown anything away. And they have an incredible repository of ephemera relating to suffragettes, women's history, all the way from 1920 up into the present. And it's going to be one day an incredible resource for our scholars already, four have written uh, articles, but there's really a huge here for more people to connect. And, uh, and Curtis, we also have beyond that because we still, we have artifacts from the pr previous owners. Um, for example, we have a postcard collection and travel diary from, um, it, it covers the period 1897 or so through 1901, for example, that was there at the house. Um, a tremendous number of artifacts uh, that, that even predate, predate the League. This is um, as it was sold as a bankruptcy proceeding by the original owner, so all of the furniture went with the house. The second owners, another prominent family, basically abandoned the house in the time that the South End went through dramatic demographic changes and they moved over to the Back Bay. And eventually this house was sold for a dollar to the League. So um, it came with everything and all of that is still there. So there's also, yes, as you're saying, Adrian, this kind of history. Yeah. Um, yeah, we still, we, furniture objects and other things that are a tremendous resource. And a couple, couple of other quick things. Um, the, the house is on the historic registry for, for the state. Um, and um, what was the other thing? It's on a historic registry and it is designated as a museum. So um, we believe that both of those things are a plus for the work that we're doing, uh, that we're doing moving forward. And, and with the help of SSV, we've been able to um, figure out, you know, how to maximize on that museum de uh, designation, but at the same time, 
be, be a place that's open and welcoming for other nonprofits that are doing similar work, for example, and those types of things. So, uh, so we're very excited about what the, um, what the future has to hold in terms of our ability to um, garner donations and endowments and things of that sort to keep, to keep the, the, the historic, um, 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 uh, historic preservation potential, you know, move, moving forward because it's just it's just a gem and and just like they were saying not just the the building itself but what the building contains uh and and we still have those teacups too that they were using um and then a whole other area that hasn't necessarily been explored is um you know i know when i moved here to boston the whole idea of black brahmins was just you know i mean i grew up in north new jersey so i had a very different lifestyle from from Black people that that were historically involved with the league, so there was a whole sort of learning process that I had to do from from a social economic cultural standpoint, just to kind of understand <laughs> these uh, these these various things. Even though, yes, I was college educated, yes, I belonged to Alpha Kappa Alpha and all those types of things, but again, it was still a whole sort of culture shock in a way. So so there can be a tremendous amount of research done. Just, just in that whole dynamic, looking at sort of the evolution of, of um, black, um, black wealth, black society, and those types of things going from that period of time into the present. And, and um, we're, we're trying to figure those things out because those are the things that are gonna drive, drive our membership and drive activity. You know, how do you make the organization continue to be open and welcoming? And I think we've been doing a better job at that because we are attracting younger younger women now. I, I used to be one of those younger women, but not anymore, but now we're attracting more younger women because we just have to figure out how to, you know, um, uh, contemporize um, membership in the league, basically. It's an incredible intersection of many things that are extremely relevant right now, especially in the wake of what happened at the Capitol, what happened earlier mm -hmm. this year with George Floyd and the protest movements emerging out of that. I cannot think of another property in Boston that has so many vectors of significance converging at one point. Um, you have the um, history of slavery that's invoked in a positive way through the Underground Railroad activity on this site. You have women's history, you have black history, you have a major piece of architecture within the city containing an inspiring organization with an ongoing mission, as well as this collection of historic artifacts and resources and personality that all of them I think are communicating something that is very much needed at the present time. And so we're very hopeful that um, the grant money will come through that will allow the league to continue to run from this space and to also open it to become something more welcoming for a wider audience. Can I ask a question real quick? Um, where do we send our check? I don't see a donate button. Where do I send my check? Yeah, we haven't. <laughs> We haven't put the donate button in yet. That will that will be coming that will be coming soon. But in the meantime, if you do want to mail a check, you can mail it to the League of Women for Community Services, 558 Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, what is it? 02118. Yes. Yeah. Okay. There we go. I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, and you know you can go to the website and under contact, there is a way to reach us if you have any questions, comments, you want to talk about anything. Um, I and a, another member will get the emails directly and we'll be happy to chat with you. Thank you. Excellent. Can I make a comment too? Sure. Um, yeah. I'm uh, Lynn Smilich and I'm on the Boston Landmarks Commission and I'm just blown away by this. <laughs> and I think you should be a local landmark. Uh, so I'd be happy to help in that effort if, um, if there's interest. Thank you. Thank you. Definitely, definitely interests. Um, my my main role, uh, aside from being on the board, has been a uh, very hands on with the building itself in terms of uh, going through um, all the different artifacts and things that we have and starting to sort of.
create buckets. Uh, other league members have have also been wonderful at at um, you know at this endeavor. Uh, we've we we've partnered with Northeastern to to house our artifacts. Uh, of course, they won't be able to get to us for the next four years. So we're figuring out ways to begin to catalog all of these things um, in advance. Um, by, by using you know Saturdays in the building basically to scan items and things of that sort. So, so um, any help that we can get for any other avenues that can support the different work that we're doing and that could, could help uh, solidify preservation of the building is more than welcome. I think what you're saying, Lynn, is so important too that um, there are so many buildings under threat in Boston and I've been involved in a few over here in Roxbury, where I live, that went before the Landmarks Commission. And even there, I think there's an ongoing conversation to be had that Greg Gaylor was very instrumental. You were part of that um, a few weeks ago with the inadequate demolition delays that we have in the city. And it's, it's hard to bring many of these properties into the care that they need because of the inadequate protections that um, there are. And you know, one of them that I worked on that you know about, Lynn, the Bond Hampton House, um, just yesterday began demolition of the garages, which has still been sort of an open um, question of whether that was really advisable in terms of the history of the site. Um, so I think it is like for the league important to be designated a landmark and for everyone to really think about what these protections mean and um, what they can do that's beyond just being names or um, sort of nominal significances. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear about the garages. I didn't know that was happening. Um, None of us did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not surprising, is it? <laughs> um, uh, uh, landmarking the building um, wouldn't provide any financial resources, but it would provide total protection um, along with prestige. Yes. <laughs> um, but I think yeah. this building is important in so many ways. I mean, it's ar architecturally magnificent, but just as important and just as significant as the work of the organization and the impact it's had on Boston history, you know, for a century now. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anyway, yes, we, I think that yeah. conversation should continue. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Eligibility shouldn't be questioned, right? It'll be pretty obvious. Mm. Yeah. And, and I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't hear Anita's comment. Oh, I, I was I was saying that eligibility shouldn't be uh, questioned. It looks yeah. very obvious to me. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> right. Right. Well, Jack, I want to thank you for the opportunity you gave the league to tell our story. And um, this is this is just great. We, we're happy that everyone now knows on the call here and anyone who may look at the video in the future what's happening in the history of the league. So um, again, you've got our website. So if you guys want to contact us, please do. My gosh, yeah, no, thank, thank you. It's, this has been a great, uh, a great introduction, and I use the term because it is now. I hope no more. You've got more followers and friends, and we hope to stay in the, stay in the loop and uh, uh, to get involved and stay involved. So, thank you again. Yeah, thank can you. I, can I ask a quick thank question? You so how how your membership is doing these days? Small but steady is yeah. what I would yeah. say. Yeah. And um, I'm I'm old school because I'm an old girl. Okay, and um, I I think that because of the dedication of the um, fourteen or so, there's a core group of directors of fourteen, but so dedicated and so willing to put all they have into this that we're not in a position to do heavy recruiting of board members right now, but that um, we have insight that Adrian has a brain that she talks about doing, repairing things that are old and obsolete. So we're going to use her brain to help us repair 558 and as she says bring a more contemporary approach to 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 membership 
but I say it has to be done carefully. Uh, we've been very fortunate, um, you know, many times small organizations like this and you're trying to fundraise and there's always somebody willing to sow a little discontent and um, keep a little confusion going and we don't, we don't have that. So I just think if we can get going um, and get some of these projects underway uh, with funding, that it will allow us the time and we can ease our brains a little and think about how we will improve membership in the organization and, and just how we will present it. So it's a, an yeah, ongoing. You know, obser observation is that truly the building is a magnificent uh, landmark within the city, but the mm -hmm. organ, but it, but it, it, it's a shadow of, I think, the organization that you ladies are continuing and that it would be the real travesty would be not so much the building in the landmark status, but the, the, the demise or continued decline of your organization. And, yeah. uh, you know, if there, this, as Jack has said, finding it was difficult, um, understanding that it exists is magnificent and being able to expand the outreach and, and awareness of this organization would be something that um, I, I, know, I know I'm going to bring this to David Lee's attention when I get back to the office, but um, there, there are certainly those in high position or in, in influential positions, particularly in the minority community, who may, he may already know of it, but they can certainly add to your exposure and, and help in your, uh, uh, in your overall, hope, hope in, in broadening that overall exposure and maintaining your viability moving forward. Yeah, we actually, um, we actually recently put out an RFP uh, and we got responses for consultants that will help us in terms of the uh, organization specific things like membership generation, uh, looking at programs and things of that sort. So we are embark embarking on that, but we can, you know, we can use all, all the willing helpers that we, you know, that we can get. But definitely uh, that is something that has been on our radar. It, it is a priority, but again, being a small group of people, we have to sort of move incrementally because what we don't want to do is to get overwhelmed in any particular place and then something falls. Yeah. So, um, but, but that's why we reached out and, um, and uh, we've gotten a response, you know, we've gotten a response to the RFP. There is a prospective grant that could, that could fund that, that type of support for the league. And I think once that gets in place, we'll be able to move forward a lot faster when it comes to looking at membership and, and different ways that people can become members. Because of course we want to, we want to expand people's ability to, to, to support the league, um, uh, both from a capital standpoint and programmatically. Good luck. That's really okay. in this regard is that the league and the building are very much intertwined. And as I was saying earlier, <clears throat> conditions at the building have kind of overtaken the league, that the brownstone in particular has been exfoliating. And many of you who know the South End will know the scaffolding that's been on the outside of the building for quite some time now to protect people. Um, unfortunately, things have gotten to the point where the league cannot right now really occupy or use the building. So this is part of the urgency of the current preservation planning effort is to get things to the point where um, the building, which is the identity of the organization, can once again also facilitate the activities of the organization. Um, that's the challenge right. we're facing. And, right um, and individually, we're in and out of the building all the time. So it's not like there's no one looking after the building. We're continuously working inside the building relative to artifacts and things of that sort. And also the um, ornate um, iron that you see on, um, ornamental iron that you see on the outside of some of the pictures of the building uh, that is safely housed at, um, at my facility in Lawrence, Mass. So, um, so we have that, you know, it's intact. Um, and, and hopefully we'll be able to restore that also. But for safety reasons, uh, we need to take it off the building because we didn't want the, the ornamental iron to further degradate the, uh, the exterior of the building by weight and, and things of that sort and starting to fall down. So we wanted to make sure that we salvage that. So, um, so it's not gone, it's just in hiding. 
Good to hear. Great. Well, that that was useful to bring it up, sort of bring it up to date, and also uh, emphasize the the need, uh, which uh, I hope will be met. So, thank you guys again. Uh, I know we're running a running a little late, so Susan Green, thanks for uh, letting us uh, <laughs> go a little further than usual. But uh, it was worth it. it was now wonderful. we come over. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was great. The, the agenda. The agenda lists a number of upcoming, uh, there's some announcements of uh, upcoming events and programs. Uh, if you uh, are able to download the agenda, I guess most uh, most uh, right up front there is this evening, the APT, the Northeast chapter. If, I don't know if it's still, uh, if the program's still open for uh, um, people to join in, but uh, it's <clears throat> focusing on, um, it's entitled How the Future of historic preservation will change as a result of COVID-19. So it's this evening at 5 p.m. and uh, one can uh, register via through the uh, APT Northeast website and then there's a uh, member clicks or whatever. Uh, then next Thursday uh, there's a, a historic New England program uh, and other sponsors I think about the uh, Triple Deckers. Triple Decker, a New England love story. It's a talk by Mark Levitt. Um, so, sorry about that, the other phone going. Um, and then uh, on the 19th, uh, there's a, uh, was sponsored by the National Park Service. I'll just toss this away. Oh, dramatic. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, uh, let me proudly do my part. It's a, a talk uh, um, discrimination about uh, discrimination at the Charlestown Navy Yard. And that's Tuesday the 19th at 6 p.m. an online event. Um, and uh, the uh, Student Conservation Association intern, Megan Woods, is uh, giving that talk. And then there are others as well. So um, uh, in March will be the plastics. We are co-sponsoring uh, uh, architectural plastics and polymer composites um, program that was to be a conference, but a COVID-19 version, it's, it's being transformed into a conference proceedings plus a package of a whole ton of material. Are there, and there are other items on there that you can see. Anything that anyone else would like to add in terms of upcoming announcements, or whatever. Oh, by the way, the Mass Historical Commission, the, we were talking about present Reservation projects fund uh, the matching grant program. Round 27 is that uh, they've announced that tomorrow uh, materials are available. Uh, it's really open for municipalities and nonprofit organizations for matching grants, as the league knows. So, um, deadline for that is uh, mid March. <laughs> Any uh, anything else in uh, Invisible Ink on the agenda? Anything, uh, anything uh, people want to share? Oh, all good. Right. Thanks, Jack. Thank you all. So uh, hope to see folks again next month. And uh, thank you again for the this wonderful presentation. Thank you for thank having you, us. Very well. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay. Bye. Good morning. Thank you.